Okay, welcome to our little mini presentation, our little lecture about psychodynamic theory. I know in your textbook it talks a little bit about Jung and Erickson and object relations theory, and those are all related to psychodynamics, particularly in the focus on the building of the personality and processes that take place inside of the client. But for our lecture right now, I just want to focus a little bit on Freud. I think Freud is often very misunderstood. He, there's a lot of stereotypes about Freud. Some of those he definitely earned. Some of them I don't think he necessarily deserves. But there's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about his approach and his theory. So I want to focus for the next 15-20 minutes just on Freud and hopefully clarify some of those things for you. Okay, so some basic ideas about Freud's theory. His theory is very big and very complex in many ways. So we're just going to focus on a couple of core basic ideas that are really important. The first is the idea that what happens in the past is powerfully influential on the way we behave and think and feel in the present. Freud would say especially the first five years of life, what happens to us, uh, our relationships in those first five years, play a role in, in forming our personality, in helping determine how we react and respond to the world, how we think and feel about ourselves, how we think and feel about others. He wouldn't say that the past purely determines the present. It can be changed. Experiences I have now will play a role in shaping and forming who I am. But he would say that for the most part, our personality is laid down in those first five years of life. Another important part of his theory is the idea that there are two universal drives that motivate us. These are the things that kind of impel us to behave in certain ways, trying to satisfy these two drives. The first one is the libido, and it's kind of the life-affirming or the pleasurable, joyful, comforting motivation. It often gets confused with sex, and sex is a part of libido, and I think we can all safely say that Freud may have overemphasized the role of sex in libido, but it's just a part of libido. Things like enjoying a nice meal with loved ones, that can be satisfying to our libido. The joy we take in just being outside and enjoying nature, that's also part of our libido. So anything that brings us pleasure, comfort, joy, that is life-affirming, that's all libido. Its opposite is the thanatos. Freud didn't write a whole lot about it, but said that it did exist and it was there and it's one of the things that motivates us. And this is kind of the, the side of us that enjoys destroying things. I think about little kids and how much fun they have knocking down towers or building things up and destroying them. For adults, I think about movies with lots of explosions and seeing big things get destroyed and blow up. Uh, remember those uh, fundraisers in high school where they would bring a car out and you could pay a couple of bucks and hit on it with a, a sledgehammer? That's satisfying to our thanatos. So two drives that motivate the things that we do, that help shape uh, who we are. The way we deal with those drives plays a large role in how our personality gets formed. Another key idea of Freud's is the idea that many of the things that take place in our mind are outside of our conscious awareness. That we're only conscious of a very small part of the things that take place in our mind. But there are things that are motivating us, that we're reacting in certain ways, based on things that are outside of our conscious awareness. One way to think about how our libido and our thanatos play a role in influencing our personality and the way we feel about ourselves and the world is to use a hydraulic metaphor. I think about hydraulic energy and I think about big cranes with the large pistons and uh, fluid flows into the pistons and put it under pressure and that's what moves the, the crane around. So just like that, Freud would say our minds are kind of like this hydraulic system. The libido and the thanatos, those motives, are the energy in the system. And the way we deal with that energy plays a role in how we are in the world. When that, that energy gets blocked or it's not managed well, we put too much of it in one place and not enough in another, or we don't do anything with that energy, uh, then that leads to tension and anxiety. So our personality depends on how well we manage that kind of energy in, in our psyche. And that can lead to, to positive things and it can lead to negative things. 
client problems typically are the product of mismanagement of that kind of libido and thanatos. Let's take a look now at, at our personality. How is it that our personality forms? What kinds of things lead to problems with our personality and our functioning? Freud suggested that there are three parts to everyone's personality, and it's how those three parts interact with each other that can either lead to well-being and mental health or can lead to the kinds of concerns that clients come in to get help with. The first part of our personality Freud suggested is called the id. And I sometimes think about it as the driver. It's what's driving the car of our personality. You could even think of it as the engine to the car, but the driver. Freud said that we're all born with an id. We all have one. It's not something that we have to learn or grow. We just all have it. And that's where our libido and our thanatos, those drives that motivate us, uh, are, are located. They're, they're in the id part of our personality. So we're all born with a libido and a thanatos and a desire to satisfy those life-affirming or life-destroying kinds of impulses and desires. The, the id doesn't think. It's not consciously rational. It's illogical. Uh, it's amoral, and meaning that it doesn't consider whether something's right or wrong. It just wants to do what it does and not have to think about it. It, it doesn't think about it. It's also very illogical and very self-focused. It's just all about what it wants and what it needs. Uh, the best example of an id is probably an, an infant. An infant wants food and they want it now. They don't want to have to wait. They don't want to have to ask for it. They don't want to have to do anything. They just want to be fed when they're hungry. And when the diaper needs to be changed, they want it changed right then. So as a, as a young child, the id is kind of what's running the show. And that id operates on what Freud called the pleasure principle. All it does is seek instant gratification for its desires and its drives. It wants things to be comfortable, pleasurable, not hard, no demands. So kind of like our, our little dog there, that's a, a good example of, of an id at work. So the id, kind of the driver part of our personality. So if the id is the driver and just wants to drive fast and drive wherever it wants to go, no paying attention to any consequences, then the next part of the personality operates kind of as the law. That part Freud called the superego. And this is the part of our personality that develops out of social interactions, relationships, going back to that infant that just wants to eat whenever it wants to eat or wants comfort whenever it wants comfort. Sometimes when we want to eat whenever we want to eat, society says, you can't eat right now, you're going to have to wait. Even if the waiting is just about, it's going to take me a minute to prepare your bottle or to prepare your food, it has to wait. So it's, it's in living with others that we start to, to learn, Freud said, that there are, are some limits placed on our id. It, the id just can't run wild. I can't drive as fast as I want to drive down the road. Society says I have to limit that impulse and put restrictions on it. So that's what the superego is doing. It's the law part of our personality. And it's trying to set some boundaries around what the id can do, what the id can't do, when it can do it, how much of it it can do. And that produces some internal tension because the id is going to keep pushing. Here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. And the superego part of our personality is saying, no, don't do that, don't do that, you can't do that. Uh, and that creates some internal tension or problem for the child. Think about how young children learn to say no at about two. And that would right about when Freud suggests the superego starts to develop as we demand that they learn to control their bladder and their bowels. We, we want them to be potty trained. That's society saying, you have to put a limit on some boundaries around the functioning of your id that just wants to go to the bathroom whenever it wants to go to the bathroom. Creates some tension. Kids get upset. They learn to say no. Some kids really struggle with that. Now, the, the superego is not much more logical, if at all, than the id. But the id is operating on that pleasure principle, and the superego is operating on what Freud called the perfection principle. It's demanding perfection. It's not just that you need to limit your id a little bit. It says, no, you need to be perfect. You can never violate these rules. Complete control and constraints on the id. would probably try to overrule and shut down the id if it had the ability and the, the power to, to do that. It tries to do that. So another way of looking at this is that there's, there's this tension and conflict between the, the superego and the id, and they're having this kind of ongoing boxing match battling with the other, each other. The id saying, hey, I want to do this now, and I want it 
do it my way and superego saying no there are limits there are constraints you have to back off don't do that don't do anything so there's this unconscious tension between those two parts of our personality and when that exists when there's no way to to deal with that tension that's what Freud says leads to problems so what we need is a good referee that can get between those two boxing parts of our personality and help manage things so that they're not constantly beating each other up. We need to find a way to deal with that tension, with those impulses, as well as with the demands of society, the kind of rules for social living from the superego, and find a way to do that in a healthy way. So our id is telling us that we want to drive at 150 miles an hour through the middle of Laramie, screaming with the radio blaring the whole way, just having a good time, and maybe we want to have a drink or two while we're doing it. And our superego is saying, oh, probably better to just sit at home and drink some warm milk, leave the car in the garage, that would be better, that would be fully living up to what society expects of us. And Freud said we need a part of us that can deal with the tension between those two extremes. And that's what the ego does. The ego is the mediator between those, the pressures of the id and the demands of the superego. Freud said that this was the, the psychological part of our personality. It's the thoughtful, rational, non-reactive thinking part of who we are that tries to balance those demands and operates on what Freud called the reality principle. It says it's unrealistic to be perf perfect. It's also unrealistic to never have id demands or to never want to, to feel good and to, to be comfortable. So it tries to find a way to balance all three of those things, to balance the demands of the id, the demands of the superego, with just the real life. So the infant, again, wants to eat right now. The, the superego of the infant is saying, you're just going to have to wait. And the ego is the part of our personality that says, okay, I know it's coming really soon, so I'll just sit tight and I'll be comfortable and I'll try and be okay while I wait for it to come. It's the part of our personality that helps us manage the world and be healthy. If we have a strong, healthy ego, we're probably going to be mentally well. All right, we've talked about some healthy functioning, so I want you to, to think for a second. If that's what healthy functioning is about, what might lead to problems, according to Freud's theory? So take a second and reflect on that. You might pause the video to think about it, maybe jot down some ideas. If that's what healthy functioning is, then what might cause problems for a person? You can pause now and turn it back on when you're ready to go. All right, so according to Freud, what leads to problems is when we have a weak ego. When our ego isn't strong enough to manage the demands of the id, isn't able to manage the demands of the superego, and can't deal with, with the reality of life as it deals with those demands, then as like a pot on the stove, pressure begins to build within the system. And if it's not managed, if it's not dealt with in a healthy way, and you end up with either overindulgence or some perfectionism or some mixture of the two, you can end up with something like a steam explosion where the pressure builds and builds and then you get bigger problems and bigger problems if it's not dealt with. Now Freud said that when our ego is unable to deal with the, the demands of reality, the demands of our id, the demands of the superego, that we often use defense mechanisms to get by in the moment. And these are not necessarily always bad. We all use them when something's kind of knocks us off our, our center or our balance or surprises us, we might use a defense mechanism to deal with it. Now Freud described these defense mechanisms as kind of unconscious distortions of reality. We, we unconsciously bend reality in a way to help us manage the anxiety that's coming from, from within us. When we do this, it kind of weakens us. It saps our psychic energy. We're not as healthy or as well when we're using these defense mechanisms. And if if we use them all the time, if, if we depend on defense mechanisms to, to cope with the world, then that will lead to poor functioning. But again, that always happens because we've got a weak ego, or our ego is just not strong enough to deal with the world and our id and our superego. Okay, so if it's the unconscious conflict between those parts of our personality, 
and the, the somewhat unconscious ways that we're dealing with that conflict, if that's what leads to problems, then what are our goals as counselors to try and help resolve those problems? Well, the first one is to make all that unconscious stuff conscious. When we are aware of the conflict between those parts of our personality, and when we're aware of the ways that we're, we're dealing with them, those kind of automatic unconscious ways that we deal with them, then we can, rather than just be reactive to what happens around us, we can choose how we want to act. So making the unconscious conscious is the first step, the first thing that we want to do. And then related to that, we want to strengthen the ego. If a key component of what causes problems is a weak ego, an ego that can't deal with those demands, then we want to help a person strengthen their ego, strengthen their ability to psychologically recognize and manage those demands in healthy ways. So healthy management of those drives and of the limits of the superego, and less reliance on unconscious kind of defense mechanisms to get by. All right, we've talked about some of the thinking components of the theory, what causes problems, what's needed to resolve them, and now we want to shift and talk a little bit about how do we do that? How do we help a person become more aware of their unconscious conflicts, and how do we help a person strengthen their ego? But before we do that, we need to introduce two other key concepts in Freud's theory. First is the issue of transference, and that's the idea that we relate to other people based on our past relationship experiences, very similar to what we talked about with uh, attachment style in uh, Jane's developmental class. So your client is going to come in and they're going to relate to you in some ways influenced by their past relationship experiences. And Freud said this is very helpful because in doing that, the client is teaching us a little bit about their past relationship experiences, the things that formed their superego formed their ego and the way their ego manages the world. So transference, he thought, was very, very helpful. At the same time, he recognized that we're doing the same thing with our clients. He called that counter-transference, that the counselor is going to relate to the client in some part based on their own relationship history. And that's a good thing if we can be aware of it and can manage it. It's only a problem if, it's, if we're not aware of it and we don't know how to deal with that, but we just treat them the same way uh, we try to relate to other people in our life. We're not relating to them as real people. So transference and counter-transference. All right, let's talk now a little bit about the doing part of counseling. All right, so the doing part. Remember, our goals are to make unconscious conflicts and material ways of dealing with things to make those conscious and then to help strengthen the ego of the client so that they can manage all that stuff in a healthy way. So what do we do? What are the techniques? There's a number that are considered pretty classic Freudian techniques, but really anything that will lead to that, to those two goals, can be considered part of Freudian therapy. Some of the things that he did was working with the transference, so trying to encourage that transference relationship, and we'll come back to that in a second. But then as the client relates to them, using that material to understand and to help the client understand what's going on unconsciously and to strengthen their ego. Dealing with resistance is a common Freudian technique, and that involves understanding, helping the client understand why they might struggle to talk about certain things or to deal with certain things. Why do they avoid it? And then helping them develop ways to approach that. How, do, how can we help clients learn to turn their boats into the wind? Free association is a common technique in which the counselor might just provide a word or an image and just invite the client to say whatever they can say, whatever they want to say, without filtering. And it's that without filtering that's important, because then we're trying to tap into what's going on in the client's unconscious. And Freud was an expert at this. He, one of his, his key contributions was the idea that just by listening and observing carefully, you can learn what you need to, to learn, and you can help the client grow. So free association... Dream analysis, the same kind of thing. He would listen to people talk about their dreams, and he considered dreams to be the royal road to the unconscious, that the unconscious is sending us messages through our dreams. So when clients talk about their dreams, trying to understand what could be the, the hidden underlying or what he called the latent meaning in the elements of the dream, and how did that help us understand where the ego was weak and where the ego could be stronger. Then finally, interpretation. We get all this material, and then we gently try to help clients understand what the meaning of all this stuff is. 
We do it tentatively. We don't say, oh, well, you dreamed about this and that means this. But we might wonder out loud, you know, you told me about this relationship with your father and I wonder how that might be playing out right now in your relationship with your boss at work. Or I've noticed that you treat me this way. It sounds like how, how you related to your father. I wonder how that might be playing out in your relationships at work. So more of a tentative kind of cautious wondering about things. Finally, how should a psychodynamic counselor be with their client? What, what's the relationship like? What's the role of the counselor? And the first and most important point, perhaps, is that we want to be really intentional. Freud would say that we need to relate to the client in ways that are going to help us meet our goals, to bring unconscious material into conscious awareness and to strengthen the ego. And the connection that we have with the client is a key part of that. Freud would use the relationship in ways that would try to help move the client towards those two goals. Uh, traditionally, historically, one of the ways that he would do that is by trying to be a blank screen. He would sit a little bit behind the client, have the client lie on a couch, out of the client's view, so that he was a blank screen. It's easier to transfer, to relate to, to Freud. Um, if we don't see him, then we're not going to relate to him as Freud. We might relate to him more as our father or our boss or our mother or whomever. So that blank screen. Over time, most uh, psychodynamic counselors have kind of dropped that role, and they try to relate in as much of a human, caring, compassionate, close way as, as possible, like, like all theories have, have kind of shifted over time. And then again, there's that gentle interpretation. So my role is to gently invite you to consider how the things that you're sharing and showing me, how they might have a deeper unconscious meaning that will help you understand the, the conflicts going on inside you and to help you give you the opportunity to strengthen your way to manage them in healthy ways. So that's Freudian theory for us, and we're there at the end now. Thanks.